I don't want to wear suits ever again. <laughs> Hate to admit it. You look great, though. <laughs> Thank you. You look great. And I look to, I'm just there. Of course. directed a few episodes, obviously behind the camera. Um, how, how did you find that um, difference between like kind of being in front of the camera and directing it and then like kind of what new insights did that give you? What was the last part? Uh, what kind of new insights did that give you? Did it influence anything? Right. That's a, is this still on? <laughs> check, check. Oh, no. Yeah, there we go. Um, the question was about directing. Uh, one of the greatest gifts of Suits was that I got to direct. It's something I've always wanted to do in, in college. Um, I did a lot of directing of theater. I ran a theater company. I love that level of immersion. Um, oftentimes, as an actor, I can get kind of bored. You know, as actors, we do our little thing on set, and then they push you into a corner while everybody else does gets ready for the next thing. And as a director, you get to be really involved in all of it. Um, and I and I just like being involved. I'm fa you know I'm a photographer as well. I'm fascinated with um, with image. I love cameras. I love building a shot. I love working with cinematographers. So um, getting to direct on suits uh, and then getting to direct some of my you know I directed a short film of my own. Um, I think it's actually better suited to my nature. It like turns my brain off and keeps me busy all day. So. Um, and, and the, in terms of insights, it just gave me a lot of understanding of what a director, you know, as actors, we can be quite selfish and think it's all about us. Surprise, surprise. And once you actually direct, you realize, like, no, a lot of these things have been decided before you show up on set, and you should do your best to, like, um, work with the director and figure out what their vision is rather than just trying to, like, put your idea into it. Realize that you're a smaller piece of a much larger puzzle. Um, so it just gave me a lot of respect for the amount of work and time that goes into you know, that's gone into a scene before an actor shows up to it, you know? All these conversations have happened and the set has been built and these lights are there for a specific reason and the cameras are there for a specific reason. And uh, being put in that position gave me a lot of, um, yeah, respect for, for that and I think made me a more uh, amenable actor to work with. Hello. Hi. Thank you so much for coming. and. I'd also like to thank you on behalf of the legions of lawyers you've inspired. <laughs> how, how many? <laughs> how, how, many, how many people in this room are studying law or are gonna be lawyers? <laughs> Good, okay. And I'd also like to personally thank you for your explanation of offer acceptance and consideration that definitely helped me for my interview. <laughs> Wait, I didn't even hear it. Offer acceptance and consideration? That, that, def that helped me with my interview to get into here. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, my, my question is, is that um, having embodied a character like Mike for so long and f over such a long process and embodying it so well, are there any char characteristics or traits or parts of Mike Cross that you feel that you've carried with you since the show has ended? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I mean, there's, it's, there's, there's not much of a division. I'd like to say, like, I'm an actor, and I'm, there's not much of a division between who I am and who Mike was, especially after seven years of doing it. Like, there's so many things that are, like, we are kind of, as I said, it was sort of birthed from that same desperation of, like, give me a shot, please. And it continued that way. So it's almost actually harder for me to find the things that are different. Um, you know, Mike's got a huge heart. He cares about people. Um, I think he's at his worst when he's uh, behaving selfishly. Again, like I don't remember much of the show, I'm getting to experience it again, but from my memory, whenever Mike kind of tries to replicate what he considers to be Harvey energy, it goes terribly wrong for him, <laughs> you know? But when he's at his best is when he's taking the tools he's losing from, uh, that he's learning from the sharks and he's putting it into his own world of really fighting for people that don't have a voice. And um, yeah, there's, there's something about, about that part that I try to always remind myself of, because I, I can be guilty of trying to maybe be a bit more of a Harvey when I need to remember to be a Mike. <laughs> Definitely, thank you so much. Thank you. Woohoo! <laughs> 
Hi, this Hi. is really wild. I've watched all of Suits and all the episodes, so I'm kind of starstruck right now. <laughs> um, but this actually relates to what you said about speaking up for people who don't have a voice. I think in a world where increasingly we also expect celebrities to speak up about what is going on around us, I was wondering whether you think that actors have a particular role to raise awareness about what is happening, for example, in Gaza. I mean, you must have heard about the encampments both in America and here. Do you conceive of yourself of someone who could bring about some form of change? And if so, how? Yeah, it's a really good question and something I've spent obviously a lot of time recently thinking about, um, but not just recently, over the last few years, there's this uh, idea that we we have a platform, we do have a platform, right? And I've always been deeply uncomfortable with it. You know, before what we're dealing with now, um, you know, I've been approached so many times to be like, support this, can you support this? Can you put this out there? And I've always, I've at times done it and been like, yeah, I'll post the thing, of course. So I, why wouldn't I support that? Yes, I'll do that. And then I've ended up feeling pretty empty and shallow about it because I can't, I can't give it the full breadth of my attention afterwards and it just becomes a post that I put out and then it makes me feel like I've just done a thing almost like a virtue signal or I've just like said yes to something but I'm not really following it up with the kind of action that's necessary. So, you know, we're in a really particular moment where I'm just struggling. I, I you know, you look at my social media, all I do is post like photos that I take and then like what somebody asked me to post about like a speaking engagement or something. Because I find especially with things that are going on right now, um, I just get, how do I put it? It sounds like a cop out, I think. And it's why I'm always so even scared to say this. It sounds like a cop out. But I think the more that people who don't have the level of expertise and experience that are necessary to have like a really high level discussion about things, put their voices in the mix, it actually like muddies it and it and it and it and it can keep the other voices that really need to be heard um, from from getting the amplification that they need. And I and I know that that can even sound like a cop out. But that's sort of where I've landed with it. It's like until I can until I can enter into a conversation and have it long term, and 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 feel confident that I have the level of expertise that I need, then I'm just sort of acting as a platform for other people's ideas, and that has always made me really uncomfortable. And obviously, we're at a at a tipping point now where this is this is uh, this is a big deal. So that's that's why if you're like watching my particular platform why it's very quiet but I spend I mean I've quite quite honestly had a lot of sleepless nights trying to figure out what my responsibility is if any yeah thank you so much I'll just say I think there's more than one way to bring about and change and make a difference right so it starts with educating yourself as well yeah so exactly I hope you managed to do that yeah thank you. that is definitely something I'm focusing on thank you thank you um, I just look to the gentleman <laughs> You're in my eye line at the front. <laughs> Appreciate it. Howdy. So, <laughs> my question specifically focuses on your role as the uh, co-director in the final season of Suits. Where are you from? What's going on? Uh, I'm from Texas. <laughs> Hell yeah. Um, so, in the final season, Megan obviously wasn't able to be in as many scenes due to her personal commitments at that time. <laughs> Our <laughs> Her personal commitments, okay, yeah. Are there any scenes that you wish she would have been available to shoot or an alternative ending uh, that Suits could have gone down had she been available? This feels pointed, like you have something you want to point out. <laughs> this feels like you have an idea. Um, I think it ended perfectly. Uh, you know, I, I didn't know that I was going to leave fully. I was trying to figure it out. And then, you know, obviously what was happening was happening with Megan, and there was just this thought I had, which was like, it is better for the show that we go together. You know, you're, I knew she was going to go, and I didn't want to linger around in the aftermath of that. I was already had this impulse that maybe it was time for me to go, that I'd sort of done everything that I could do. I felt like I was in danger of becoming very repetitive. I also just on a personal level had been away from you know my girlfriend who's now my wife 
for seven years, we had been long distance from each other, and I just really wanted to go home <laughs> and start that part of my life. Um, so, no, I, I felt really good about the way that it concluded, but I'd love to have your notes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I just looked to the member there. Access. This is a very starstruck moment because I took the Oxford Union membership last year when Gabriel was coming. And he put out an Instagram reel that said he met someone who watched Suit 17 times. That was me. And now to meet you, so it's like full circle. Uh, so it's, uh, my question was that, what has been your favorite episode to direct as a director and why? And second, to quote a Canadian, Wayne Gretzky, you miss 100% shots that you don't. So I'm going to take one. Can I come there and please give you a hug, if that's all right? I didn't, I, it, I didn't hear it. I don't understand. I, I got the directing question, and then everyone went, oh, and I was like, oh, wait. Okay, the it. second one was to quote a fellow Canadian who said you miss the 100% shots you don't take. So uh, I'm going to take one, which is can I come there and give you a hug if it's all right? Come on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now everybody, one at a time. Let's go. Uh, that's very sweet. Um, the first question you asked me was about direct, like, which episode was the memorable one to direct. Yes. Um, uh, I, I would just say the first one. I don't even. I think the first one. I mean, it, the, again, I'm, I'm all about beginnings here. But I was, you know, the, the terror and the like just making that transition from being the guy in scenes with people to being the person who was telling people kind of what to do and having a vision and getting to work with all of the people behind the scenes and forging those relationships with everyone um, was such a huge moment for me. Um, and and, and this sort of changed the way that I approach work since. So I would say the first one. I also had the honor of directing the 100th episode, which I think was the last one I directed. Um, and that was a big deal because that was a big deal. They were going to promote the 100th episode. It's just a big t time in any series. So the fact that they entrusted me with that was, was uh, a huge honor. I felt really grateful for that. Thank you. I'm also a lawyer, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> to the next. Uh, I look to the member just here. Uh, thanks for coming. This has been great to hear from you. Um, my question's two parts. I think some people could be considering a career in law and watch it and go, this is not for me. These are terrible people that don't treat people very well. Do you, when people talk to you about law, would you encourage them to take that career path and why? And given you played a lawyer for so long and have a, a version of understanding the law. Could you see a universe in which you are a lawyer yourself? <laughs> Not in the least, no. <laughs> um, I don't know that I have any insight into what it would be like to be a lawyer because, I mean, how much of our show has anything to do with what it looks like to be, it, to, to be a lawyer? Do you know? I don't know, you guys tell me, you're studying law. I mean. Um, you know, our show was originally designed to be a show about people in finance before we shot it. It was, a, it, the, show, the script was about people in finance because our showrunner, Aaron Korsh, worked in finance. But you don't make shows about finance. You can't have things that happen on a weekly basis in that world and keep it um, interesting and dynamic. And so they just made it a law show. But like inherently, I think in the DNA of it, which is odd, and I'm saying this to a bunch of people that chose their professions based on it, but it's... <laughs> You know, the, that's just there as a way for us to explore a bunch of different kinds of stories week to week. In terms of what it actually is to be a lawyer, um, I, I can't imagine I'd be very good at that. I will say, like, I love to argue. <laughs> <laughs> and my mother always said I'd be a good lawyer because if I wanted something, I could spend a week making my case for why it needed to happen. So there is some part of me that I think could excel at that. Um, once I have an idea about the way something should be, I, I like to dig in. Like the idea that you guys come into this room and have these debates and, 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 and you know, roll up your sleeves and get in, that, that sounds really compelling to me. So that part of me um, could maybe be a lawyer, but uh, I just don't know if I have uh, the patience for, first of all, the clothes. 
I don't want to wear suits ever again. <laughs> Hate to admit it. You look great, though. <laughs> Thank you. You look great. Um, yeah, I don't, I'm, I don't think I'm built for, like, an office environment, but I, I, I think I am built for, like, fighting the good fight. And I think whenever people tell me they're inspired to be a lawyer because of the show, I just go, good one or bad one? You know, because there's some lawyers out there that are, you know, maybe not fighting the good fight. So Mike is a fight the good fight kind of guy. Fantastic. Right. Look to Sarah. <laughs> Hello again. Hi. I'm a fellow Canadian. Um, I promise your show was not a nuisance to us. You guys are the pride of our city. Um, <laughs> so I have a Toronto-related question, and I'm happy that you pronounce it like Toronto, not Toronto. You're basically a native. <laughs> um, so what were your favorite aspects of Toronto, and do you prefer Canada over the U.S.? Whoa. 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 I'm sorry to put you on I the I just spot. got my citizenship in the States. I don't even know if I'm allowed to talk about this. <laughs> I'm a dual citizen. I didn't have to give it up. I'm dual. I'm dual. And this is going on YouTube as well. Oh, God. <laughs> There's the cameras. Um, I was born and raised in Toronto. Uh, that's my hometown. I am Canadian. I feel like I, uh, I love Canada. I've been in the United States for 24 years. Um, and I've, you know, I've met my wife there. I have all my friends there. I've raised two little, I'm raising two little girls there. Um, it's a strange time to be in that country, and uh, I don't even know what your original question was. <laughs> are it's we better than the U.S.? Are you, yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> uh, I don't know about, I don't know what better means. I know that I feel more at home in Canada. I, I love Canada deeply, and I think those were my, where my roots are, and I imagine I'll probably return there again. I still already spend a couple of months every year there in the summer. Um, and getting to shoot the show in Toronto, being my hometown. Like, I left Toronto thinking, uh, you know, when you leave your hometown, you're like, I don't know if I'm ever coming back here. Like, I'm moving on with it. So to have left Toronto thinking I was done with it and to return to it, to have this professional experience that changed the course of my life, um, really reshaped that city for me. And it made it um, such a sort of special homecoming. And, you know, the sh our show is, is, is received so well all over the world, but there's something really special about people in Toronto because they, like, feel an ownership of the show because they, they watched us shoot it and they showed up to see us, you know, outside the Pierce Inspector building and doing late, like, like there's a real sense that that show belongs to Toronto. And so it was, it was uh, intensely special to kind of return home and get to have that kind of experience there. I'm glad and go Raptors. Go Raptors. Uh, just look to the gentleman there. Yeah. Apologies to the audience. One more Toronto question. Uh, so as I understand it, you went to Northern for high school, uh, which is also where I went. No. Which I think it's very cool. Um, and so could you just tell us what was your high school experience like? Um, yeah, would love to you hear You went about to Northern it. High I did, School? I did go to Northern, yeah. Wow. <laughs> Cheers. Also, I met someone from Lahore who, I, she's from Lahore, Pakistan, and I said, oh, my best friend's from Lahore, and she said, who? And I'm like, well, Babur Pirzada, and she knows his sister. <laughs> Wild. Um, Northern Secondary School changed my life forever. Um, uh, I was, there were two teachers there, Debbie Barton Moore and Rita Morris. Uh, they were the high school teacher, uh, the high school teachers, they were the drama teachers. In that high school, they had developed this program, this like theater program within this. It's an enormous school; it's like 3,000 students. It's huge, um, you know. Sort of feels like this institution, this public school in Toronto. But in this like back room on the second floor, they took over these two classrooms and they built this black box theater. Is it still there? Yeah. Oh, cool. Uh, and. Uh, it changed my life. That was where I learned that this was a thing that I could really do. That was where I found the teachers who championed me. I've talked about Debbie a lot in public like this. This was someone who s saw me, saw my potential, said this is a thing that you can do if you take it seriously. She made me work for it. She showed me that there was a path to doing this. And if I hadn't gone to that school and if I hadn't met those teachers and I hadn't listened to what they had done, what they had taught me and followed their instructions, I never would have led any of, I would never be here today. So 
you know, I'm sure for all of you, there's those teachers that sort of affect your life, that, 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 that show you something is possible at a time when you really need to hear it. And, uh, and Northern Secondary was where that happened for me. That's so cool. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> to the next. Uh, I look to the member just there. No, you, you look, yeah, you, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay, so my question is, um, so you have a lot of experience kind of with resilience, like resilience building, for example, with your like panic attacks. Uh, and now like the Gen Z generation are increasingly being portrayed as being maybe less resilient to change. Um, have you found this to be the case, for example, like directing um, films? Um, and if so, what can we do about it? Sorry, I missed it, but you said the Gen Z generation is what? Uh, like being portrayed as less resilient. I'm having such a hard time hearing it because of the... Less resilient? The Gen Z is having less resilience? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, are they? <laughs> are <don't> you? <laughs> Hopefully not. Do you mean like Gen Z, um, like just dealing with, with mental health issues in a, in a way that maybe it's just getting worse and worse? Is that what you mean? Uh, mental health as well as also the phenomenon of like quiet quitting in the workplace, perhaps being less able to deal with stress, that kind of thing. And so the question was, do I notice that as well? Mm -hmm. And do you have maybe any tips on how we can change this? Wow. Um, I don't have a ton of interaction with Gen Z, I don't think. So I would, I, truthfully, like I would never want to comment on what the experience is. I know it sort of intellectually by being a citizen in the world and hearing about what some of the struggles are. Um, but I don't know enough people uh, to, to really be able to comment on it. But I do know that, I mean, what would my advice be? It's the same advice that we were talking about at the beginning, which is, you know, taking really good care of yourself um, and r figuring out the things in your life that you can control and the things that you can't and releasing the necessity to try and control the things that you cannot um, and, and finding what makes you happy and doing that with your whole heart. I mean, it's hard to say that in a world where there's probably a job market that's terrifyingly small um, and there feels like there's all these uh, forces way beyond your control um, weighing down on you but ultimately you know you just have to be responsible keeping yourself as healthy and as positive and in a place to make the most of the opportunities that you have um, but god I wish I could weigh in more on what else you should do I don't know okay. um, yeah sorry thank you that wasn't helpful <laughs> Um, I look to the member just there. Uh, hi, so you talked a lot about um, some of your anxieties and insecurities that you had growing up and continue to deal with, um, which I find a bit like contrast to Mike Cross and the character you played, you know, who kind of walks around with a lot of confidence and acted with a lot of confidence even when he arguably shouldn't have. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I was just wondering, like, where does that come from, like, uh, within you, like, to be able to play a character like that? Like, how do you get into the mindset of, like, making that switch to someone who look, walks around, like, the most confident at all times? Just to make sure I heard you correctly, you're saying the confidence of Mike versus what it sounds like I had to deal with a lot of not feeling very confident? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, well, Mike's a fraud, right? He's, like, making it up <laughs> as he goes along. <laughs> And I think that was part of what like really drew me to it was like, oh, I can bring that part of myself to this guy. Like, I have no idea what I'm doing. All of me in the first season is being like, I don't know what I'm doing. You notice me like dropping papers all over the place and like I can't tuck in my shirt and I always look weird. Like, like I embraced that because I was like, that's how I feel all the time, right? And, and I didn't have to run away from it. Like finally it was like an asset. Like all these cool people and Harvey Specter's so cool and Gabriel's perfect and Donna's perfect and Jessica's perfect and I got to be embrace being imperfect which I had spent my whole life feeling like right and now I'm like this this really weird fish out of water in this place trying to seem cooler than I am one thing I always did have is that I was pretty smart you know and I could talk smack pretty easily and 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 Mike could too um, but it was all just a front it was all just a um, it was just a, a, a sheet of armor, you know, that we put in front of ourselves to, to, 
to try and survive in this world. And, and that's something that I felt like I had been doing for years, you know. Um, you're in Los Angeles and you're being an actor and you're always supposed to be infinitely cool and beautiful and chiseled and bad. And I just wasn't any of those things. I was this, you know, quivering mass of insecurity. And to, to just see an opportunity where that's like, oh, I don't have to run away from that. That's actually maybe what makes this character interesting. That was it. And then it grew, you know, as Mike grew more, as Mike became less of a fish out of water, as Mike starts kind of crushing it at work and becoming really good and owning it, that was happening as I was becoming more confident. And then learning the lesson of like, don't get too confident. <laughs> don't get ahead of your skis. Like, don't, don't, don't think your shit doesn't stink. And, uh, and uh, that, became a, that became a big part of my own life too, you know, like not letting my ego get the best of me. Fantastic, we've got time for one last audience question. Uh, and I look to the member just there. Thank you so much for being here today. Um, well, obviously Suits is like a hugely successful show and Mike definitely left a really, really strong impression on people. I, my question is when you kind of go on and progress on your actor career, people inve inevitably will see shadows of Mike in perhaps new characters you play. How do you navigate that? Yeah, that's a really good question. I try not to for a long time after I left Suits, I got really in my head about it. Like, oh, I gotta do something radically different, you know? Like, I have to be, like, really dark or miserable or melancholic. And, uh, again, like I said to you before, anytime I've really tried to enforce some agency, it just doesn't work, because I don't actually think that's how these careers work. Um, so I don't really think about it, to be honest. I try not to. I realize that, like, there's gonna be a thread that follows me and I really look for the opportunity and characters that I play to differentiate as much as possible. But I also embrace that there is a, there's a part of me that is always gonna be connected to Mike and I can bring some of that with me into, into another role. I don't know, I hope I get opportunities to, to really disappear into something and, and flip the script and do something really, really strange and offbeat and totally different. But um, I guess I've, I've pivoted more into just like with such a sense of gratitude that I ever, like the chance as an actor that you ever get to play a role that you guys have this response to at all is so um, unbelievable and so rare that um, I really am just deeply grateful for it and, uh, and I just kind of wait to see what comes next and as I grow and change and become different, the roles I play are gonna become different and, and I think if you see a little piece of Mike Ross through all of it, too, that's okay. It was a great part. Changed my whole life, so um, I'm you. grateful for it. Thank you so much. Um, we have one final question, uh -oh. uh, which we ask to all of our speakers um, when they come here. And I suppose we've already touched on it throughout. Um, if you had one piece of advice which you would give to the people here today, all those watching online on YouTube later, what would that one piece of advice be? It has to be one. It can be as many as you want. It can be a list. list. Yeah. Don't read the comments. <laughs> Don't read the comments. I mean, there's so many, you know. Believe in yourself. Fight the good fight. Find things you love. But really, don't read the comments. There's going to be a lot of people um, that don't uh, believe in you, that don't trust in you, that have a different opinion of what you're doing. But y you know best. You know what you're supposed to be doing. And uh, we live in a world where there's a lot of people that want to weigh in about things. Um, I obviously uh, work in an industry where that uh, it sort of happens at a pretty profound level, but I think everyone has to deal with it to a certain extent in a world where we're all online and, 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 and what did you post before, a be real? What did we do? We did a be real? Yeah. <laughs> you know, you were all doing that stuff and uh, it's fun and it connects us all, but it also, you know, can really create an, a, an opportunity for a lot of people to weigh in on what you're doing and comment on it. So I think if I have one piece of advice for, especially young people who are dealing with it more than I have to, is don't read the comments. Thank you so much. Can we have a round of applause? <laughs> Thank you. Now, I, take, I wanna take a picture. I wanna take a picture. All right. No, no, I don't want a picture of me. I just want a picture of them. <laughs> There's enough pictures of me. 
Awesome. Thanks, guys. Brilliant. Appreciate so it. Thank you.